Sweden, the country that gave us Marduk, Dissection, Watain, and many other legendary black metal bands, has produced yet another amazing outfit. It's Asko, a new band from Vannersburg that just released their debut album, Bard Nader. I'm probably getting that one wrong. Adam Chapman is an Englishman and the founder and guitarist of Asko. And he joins me today from his home in Sweden. Uh, Adam, how are you doing today? I'm very well, thanks. Um, hot weather, so it's uh, it's pretty pretty sweaty in the studio, which is where uh, I'm sitting. Uh, you and Lars Hansen, who is also your singer and bassist, bassist I'm sorry, mm. in Asko, uh, you were both in uh, Murdrik. Uh, but mm-hmm. that band recently went away. Uh, what what happened there? Nothing happened. It was. It, it's always been like a thing that I've had since the late nineties as a dark ambient project, and um, I used to play in Lord Belial for uh, six months as a session bass player um, in two thousand and thirteen. So Christ, that's a long time ago now. Uh, but that kind of piqued my interest for music again because I was inactive for for many years. Um, so I decided to start a, a new project, and I wanted to take a black metal approach. So I I, I kept the name and I wrote new music. Um, and what happened was was I started the band with a, a different singer uh, for the first album. And then we tried to put together a live band. Um, so we, we we did actually play a gig and we did have a live band for a, a few months, but uh, it didn't really work out. So um, I'd written most of the material for Ferdelson, uh album, which was the second album, uh, which Lars sang sang on. Um, and we I always intended for him to have a a bigger role in that album but because everything was written um i just wanted to get it out because it was always already a, a year delayed uh so he sang on it and i released it um and then we we talked a little bit about the third album um i, I guess this would have been murdrick's third album had we not decided to create a new band um and i always wanted large to have a, a bigger role. Why was that desire there to um, create a separate band? Why wasn't this release under Murderick from the beginning? Mm. Because um, I always felt Murderick was my solo project. Uh, it, it was never meant to be a solo project. It was supposed to be a band when we re- react, reenacted as a black metal band. Um, but I was doing all the work. I was writing all the songs. And for the second album, I wrote most of the lyrics, seventy uh, percent of the lyrics. Um, and I wanted Large to have a bigger role, and I wanted Large to to feel that he had an investment in in whatever it was we were going to do. Um, because I noticed that Large would come to the studio, he would do the songs, and then he would disappear. And um, I put in all the financial investment into the band so uh for him he didn't really have a a a deeper connection to that band like i did so we 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 talked about just changing the name and continuing but we decided that we would do something different and i wanted to i wanted to try writing a slightly different way i wanted to test a, a different approach to my songwriting and i wanted to simplify the songs a little bit i wanted to create more songs rather than collections of riffs and and bits and pieces uh, and i wanted his input and i wanted it, originally we were both going to work on the music but it kind of worked out that i did the music and he did the lyrics um but we, we produced the album together he, he contributed quite a bit musically even if I've I've written the music, he has a big input in in the final product, uh, and he has the the financial investment as well. Uh, so we we split the band fifty fifty, and I it definitely worked because his interest is much more uh, higher. His his commitment levels are much much better. <laughs> Um, musically, Ascog, I'm I'm not completely sure. There were times when I thought, yeah, I can I can totally feel a bit of dissection in it. 
I, I, but, but would you would you consider dissection to be a big influence on the on the kind of black metal that you ended up playing or complete, um, or I'm completely lost here? It, it's some it's something we got with Murderick uh, dissection comparisons, and I, I could I could never really hear it if I'm honest because dissection isn't a band I've listened a lot to. I, I do have their albums and. Uh, I, when when the song Night's Blood came out on a compilation CD, I had that song on constantly because I just thought that was fucking amazing. Uh, and when I heard the rest of the album, I thought it was okay. And I thought the Somber Lane was okay. Uh, and th and th th this was back in the day. So this isn't like me being a hipster and trying to, to deny it. But I, I think that that band were way ahead of their time, um, for sure. And... Uh, when I'm asked this question, I think the key is that my influences and John's influences and the rest of the band are probably they probably come from the same uh, bands, you know. And I I think Dissection has a lot of 80s metal in, inspi inspired uh, in their music, so that's definitely what I grew up with. I think, you know, melodically and especially my leads, they're very influenced by Iron Maiden and Dave Murray. Uh, and and I hear the, I think a lot of the Gothenburg sound in death metal comes from, kind of comes from that kind of music, Halloween and Iron Maiden. So I, I think why dissection isn't a personal direct influence, that we share these influences and that's probably where people notice the, the the, the comparisons maybe tell me a little bit i know that lars is the person who wrote the lyrics but can you tell me something about the lyrical content uh, of the album i think we we wanted to bring something back to basics with this album and we we when we went back and forth with with names for a band you know we were trying to come up with something and anything in english is pretty much taken and the, every permutation in english is taken so we we decided to look to swedish for inspiration and we, we, it's always difficult with um foreign band names because of the pronunciation and also that people have to be able to kind of not guess what it means but they have to kind of understand that that word is suitable for a, a black metal band uh so we 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 actually came up with a name because uh, all Skorg is where Laj has his um, forest house, uh, and it's actually an area. So we we decided that we would call it that because we felt. I'm that sorry. How do you pronounce the name of your band? All Skorg. I have been calling him Askok. So Uskog. Everybody does, and you know that's okay. fine. So we. We decided to go with that name, and even though the pronunciation and the way it's written for people who are non-Swedish speakers, it still works. Um, so with, with that name, we decided to, because Lars is, is a very organic kind of person, he's very much into nature and his uh, forest stuff. and. Um, you know, he's he's not a technical guy. He's not someone who drives around in flash cars or is is deep in in you know ball deep in technology, uh, which I am. I don't drive a flash car, but you know, I do. Have, I do enjoy technology. I said to him, if you're going to write the lyrics, write about what you know, because he was really worried that I've never written lyrics. He said, you know, not not properly. How can I do this? And I said, just just write about what you know. Um, and that's what he knew. So I'm really pleased with his lyrics because um, I was quite surprised what he came up with. Um, it was unexpected. Uh, so uh, the the album is a loose concept. There there was no plan to make it a concept album, but it's loosely based on some kind of dichotomy between dark, good, and evil, or dark and light. Um, but there is no other uh, there is one story about that has a sort of human supernatural element but all the other songs are, are based on nature's elements or things within nature um so we you know we didn't have to think about broad, uh, having this broad kind of topic of you know different things of war religion or whatever politics 
Um, we just wrote about sort of very basic things in nature. Um, and that's reflected in the album titles. You'll notice that each album title is just a single word. We wanted to kind of give an indication of simplicity and organicness. Uh, even if you don't read the, the lyrics, that's kind of understood from the cover. I, I always see nature as a kind of, it's almost like a horrifying place. If you, if you watch a documentary and you see like parasites crawling up into the anus of, of a bird or what have you, and it takes over its brain and it, there's some really horrific things going on in nature. And as, as people, we romanticize nature as, as beautiful and pretty. And, you know, we romanticize as, as town people that we could live in nature and, and fish and live off the land. And I think, you know, people are so far removed from what nature is about um, that we wanted to kind of reflect this in the lyrics, that, that it is a, you know, you probably wouldn't want to live like that if you were given the chance. I don't know if Large meant it that way, but I certainly, my interpretation and what we discussed lyrically was to, yes, nature should be embraced, it, it's beautiful, but it is also, it's also pretty horrifying. I assume that you, you, you had to program the drums yourself? Uh, I actually do the programming on the pre-demos that we sent to the drummer. This time the drummer didn't do so much development as as we would we, as we would have liked because he lives in uh um estonia uh so i programmed the drums and i gave him the tracks and i said uh here's here's kind of how i want it um you just do what what you think works and kind of use my my drums as a bass so he he recorded the first song he recorded was uh a song called vatten which is a bonus track on the demo and uh with each song we sent him he bec he was much more confident and he he got into some kind of groove where i had to i could do less and less i could just do very very basic beats and not have to do anything at all and and he could come up with something so towards the end of the album he was totally in sync with us uh because the the first song he would maybe do two or three revisions and i would say no well, i don't know what the hell you've done there but this is how we need it and then with each song, I think by by song five, he was he was delivering, and we we were, we weren't requiring any kind of revision, um, and that was great for me because with Murdrick I've used program drums, and that's been such a a tedious tedious thing to to do in a in a good way. Uh, it takes a lot of time to sort of program them convincingly, and and. Uh, you know, I, a lot of Luddites will know that it's programmed, but I, I get compliments all the time that, oh, you had such a great drummer on that album. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. And, th and they say, you know, it, it is a drummer, right? And I'm like, well, you tell me. If you can't tell if it's a drummer or programming, then, then it doesn't matter. But I tried to keep that like a, not a secret, but if people couldn't tell, I wouldn't admit to it. Um, so that's that's how I left it. But I noticed with this with this album, the difference having a real drummer made was was amazing and you can hear so much more liveliness and uh, there's a lot more depth in the actual drum sound that you that's very hard to in fact impossible to create with with drum samples no matter how is, good they are is it tempting you to if if there is a second album to maybe have uh, a drummer somebody that you a, a drummer like as a member of isco well, I, I've said to Rodion that if we do a second album, I would like him to to be in the band um, officially. And we agreed that if he did, was to do it, then we would do it in a way where I would send the tracks without the drums. Um, so I would program my drums and then record the tracks. And then I would send to him and I would let him have that freedom to to sort of come up with other stuff. And, you know, then then we would probably have discussions about what works and what doesn't work. Um, and because he was hired as a session drummer, he was paid, you know, a flat rate for uh, for the album or for each song. So we, we had we had the kind of agreement that I wouldn't wouldn't ask too much of him. You know, he would record it and I would say it was good or this needs fixing. And I would try and keep that to a very minimum. 
But if, if we offered him that position and he agreed, then we would need to be a bit more flexible because uh, I would like him to have more creative control. Are you very protective of the things that you create so that when somebody else changes it, it, it bothers you? No, as, as long as it's for the better. I mean, he, he did stuff on the drum tracks that uh, would have been impossible for me to program. And especially when it comes to how you hit symbols or how you you do this interplay with symbols and you, that that's that you can't program you can't sit there with a mouse and and draw that uh not not the way it's played and recorded in a studio uh so i, I i'm not protective because i feel that i can make a better album with the help of other people uh which is why i wanted large more involved because i knew that if if he had creative input, we would make a better album than I could do on my own. Um, but it doesn't always mean that I accept his his contributions. Uh, if I don't think they work or fit or they're not good enough, then I have to say, you know, this isn't this isn't working. Uh, he he wrote some music and he wrote songs for the album, but they they didn't fit, uh, and he accepted that uh, and. Hopefully, the next album he will be able to write songs that, that work with my my writing. So I'm 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 hopeful. What has been the biggest challenge that you've encountered trying to get a band started and going at your level? I think the creative issue is a is a problem because it's it's hard to to produce. It's hard for me to write music. Um, I'm not always inspired, and and I'm very. I'm kind of quite picky with with what I lay down. Um, you know, most people, a lot of people won't say think that what I do is good, and that's fine. But I I um, I'm definitely quite picky with with what I record. So I find it very difficult to write a song because if I'm not feeling that it's going anywhere or it's good, I'll, I'll drop it. Um, with other bands, I I kind of feel that people just write and and release. Uh, so that there's a lot of there's a lot of internal turmoil with writing songs because uh, I find it very difficult. So creatively, it's it's a challenge because um, with this album, and this this was what was amazing with this album for us was that we wrote all this material in about uh, five months, and for us that's that's that that never happens that way. Uh, and you know when when I wrote. The first Murderick album, I didn't think I could come up with any more songs. <laughs> and then when I wrote Further the Sun, I thought, no, that's definitely all I've got left. Uh, and I think that the, as I mentioned before, that I wanted to simplify, I think that was key because I, I see that among the blur there, you're also a guitar player probably. So you probably identify with this need to sort of be technically competent and write music that you think is interesting to play and it, it, music that's interesting to play isn't always interesting to listen to uh and it, interest music that's interesting to listen to that isn't interesting to play is actually very difficult because as a guitar player you want to have some kind of entertainment from 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 what it is you do uh, so I focus much more on just writing these songs and not worrying about whether I was entertained uh, on the guitar. Uh, and we, we've had actually criticism about the songs are simple and the songs are not bad criticism, but it's identified that that these are easy riffs and and melodies. But I think the the sum of the product as a sum is 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 uh, definitely. It has definitely been, um, it's definitely worked. Uh, I think individual elements, if you take everything down to, to its basic forms, yeah, okay, there's nothing, there's nothing new there, there's nothing, um, there's nothing original or, or amazing. But I think uh, as, a, as a product, I, I'm really happy with it, and I think it's pretty effective. I think that there is a challenge that comes from any creative pursuit, which is just trying to see how you can define success, right? Mm -hmm. Because uh, there is no denying that, for example, for a band like Metallica, Enter Sandman was an extremely successful song, mm -hmm. much more successful than Master of Puppets, even mm -hmm. though for Metallica fans, they would say, well, Master of Puppets is a much better song. 
So for you, if you say, well, the criticism is that the songs are very simple or there has been that criticism, it's difficult to, to, to maybe assess that because you think, well, but if people like the songs, even if the songs are simple, does that mean I'm selling out? Does that mean I'm not a good musician? Uh, and if the songs are complex and difficult, but very few people like them, mm. does that mean that I'm good? Does that mean that I'm bad? So <laughs> I, I, it's... It's a challenging thing because there is no doubt that I, I believe you're a very good musician, certainly, but there is no doubt that famous guitar players like, I don't know, Herman Lee of Dragon Force, if you're into that, or Satriani yeah. or Ma even Malmsteen, they could do more complex things that they do. But at some point you reach the limit of people just not wanting to watch you brag about how good you are as a, as a musician. Yeah, as a exactly. And, uh, you know, selling out, I think selling out is, is, is only relevant if you're trying to write music for people to like. Um, if you're writing music because you want commercial success, that's a completely different story. And, you know, I'm not going to jump on what I think are the latest trends to, to try and be popular. People can take it or leave it. Um, this is purely for my enjoyment and for Lars's enjoyment. And if we're happy with our product, you know, that's all we want. And if people want to buy it and listen to it, that's that's definitely really good because it means we can we can do the next album. It means we have money to to sort of invest in the band. Uh, and for people that think that that black metal should be free or, you know, these things don't cost. They, they do cost. Uh, they cost considerable amount of money and energy. Uh, and it's not about us getting the money back. But, you know, if we can if we can justify it without, you know, my kids not being able to eat for a week or whatever, that that's OK. Um, so we, we don't do it for the for the money but we would like the money to come in because it, it costs us and it would be nice not for it not to cost uh so we you know we we, we never do patreons we never do for crowd funding uh we write the music we pay for the music we release the music and you know the people will decide if it was worth paying for and that's on us if it isn't so I, I think Ascog, as I was listening to, to it today, it's a very aggressive band, right? Like the music itself is very aggressive, kind of, and I, I mean that in a, in a positive way. I don't mean violent in like kind of criminal way. Uh, so how did that anger stay within you and continue to manifest itself in your, in your art? I really, really enjoy aggression. Um, and it's what, what, attracted me to metal music in the beginning i guess um and w when i listen to a lot of black metal today i find it very very sort of easy to listen to it's almost it's pretty and it's it's atmospheric but it doesn't move me um and i really like groove and i like um I like that aggression in the music uh i like to feel a pump when i listen to something because you know, I can listen to a lot of things and think it's it's good or it's enjoyable, but I don't get this buzz. I don't get a feeling. So I try to, if I'm writing a riff and a drum beat, if I get that feeling from it in the demo stage, then I, I record it and we'll, we'll make a song out of it. And you know, the, these feelings change as you as you mix and as you layer and as you put in the vocals and. You know, when um, when we have a final product, it's it's completely different to how it started out, and the combination of of the riffs and the drums, uh, the way we play, largest vocals. You know, I, I I get a pump if I'm listening to this stuff and I'm out walking. Uh, I, I do, and I I'm not ashamed to say that. Uh, so you like listening to your own uh, music. Um, I, I do for a period. I, I don't listen to the Murdrick albums anymore because because I've listened to them and I, I've enjoyed them at the time and and then I've I've kind of tired of it. And with with uh, with this album, I've gone through periods where I can't be bothered to listen to it, and then uh, I listen again. Uh, I've heard the the album a thousand times because we I've mixed it, I've produced it. Uh, 
recorded it. I've had to deliver it. I've had to sit through um, online listening uh, stuff. Um, uh, you know, you, you, uh, and I still actually really enjoy what we've created there. Um, and I think because it's not a hundred percent my stuff, it, it it it's not self-indulgent to say that it, that I like what what I'm listening to. Uh, and and I noticed, you know, I I I put on other stuff that I listen to from years back. It could be anything from Slipknot to uh, death metal from the nineties and. You know, I like to get that feeling if I'm out walking. Where so you know you're almost sweating just from listening to the music. So I, I think the the aggression has always been there with me. Uh, I think if you've ever anyone who's seen me play live will see that I react very strongly to to what's happening uh, up on stage. Uh, people people are surprised because in my day to day I'm kind of quite relaxed and calm and maybe don't show that energy but but when i'm on stage or in the studio with uh with the music then yeah i, I like that rush so so that that's probably why it's a bit more simple because it's about the feeling it's not about complexity and the riffs complexity and the melodies uh it's just about rock and roll i assume simple. that your your job is not at all related to music right? i'm a computer programmer <laughs> It, it tends to be there are a lot of black metal computer programmers. I'm always surprised when I when I run into them. But specifically, since you're completely unrelated to to the issue of music, how do how do people react in your work or in your life when they find out that you have this this outlet? And I ask you this because obviously, often when I interview musicians, they tend to have just the band, or the band is famous enough that people cannot know that they are in a band. But in your case people may not even know about it. So when they find out how, how, how is the reaction, that, what is the perception about black metal that you encounter in your professional life? Yeah, I think um, people who don't listen to that kind of music, they're, they're always interested to, to find out what it is I'm doing. Um, that they might not like it, but I think they kind of think it's cool. Because, because of where I'm from, uh, Lord Belial is quite known even if, even if you're not into metal. Uh, because uh, we were from the same town. Uh, so w when people hear, hear that I've played bass for Lord Belial, then they're also like, oh, I I've heard of them. Uh, they might not listen to them, but you know, they're, 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 if there's something going on with Lord Belial, it's in the local newspaper as well. Uh, so I think, yeah, people have an interest in the kind of, it's a curiosity, uh, like what's all that about? Um, but th th I don't think many really know the history of black metal. So they don't associate me with Satanism or church burnings or, you know, anything deviant. And uh, obviously starting a band now is, is a big challenge. It's not a fantastic moment because you, oh. can hard, you cannot get anybody to see uh, what you're doing because there are not many concerts. I don't know, I, I don't know if, uh, what the situation was like in, mm. uh, in Sweden, but do you, have you been able to play live already as ASCOG or, or is that something that you're planning to do? No, uh, we we don't really have any plans for live work because it's it's just too much hassle. We would have to find competent musicians, and it's always it's always the same story. It's you can build something up, and then somebody wants to leave after three to six months or a year. Um, it's def it's difficult for people to be invested, uh, and especially with. Um, Musicians in this area, they, they tend to hop from project to project. So you'll find a lot of musicians where I live have been in every band <laughs> in, in this area. So uh, we won't play live. For example, when you started Murderick, I'm guessing that also with, what was it, a 20 year band, right? Because it was like from 1999 to like 2019 or 2020. I know that, that you've certainly matured and changed your approach to things. How are you as a musician? Uh, different now when you think about starting a band when it when it comes to thinking well you know probably we won't tour because it's more complex how did that maturity and that growing up affect the way in which you look at doing something artistic like music yeah when, when you're young you want to you want to do it as a job you know there's nothing better than playing music live and there's there's nothing better than being creative but 
you know i'm i'm over 40 now so my my approach to life is completely different i have a stable job that's where my income comes from i i don't need to do this as a job and i don't think i would want to do it as a job um anymore um so my approach has been that it's purely a creative outlet uh and and from that respect, there's no need to compromise. I, I don't have to have a label that is in, investing in the album and then wants to have some kind of control. I don't have to answer to anybody. Um, so from that perspective, it's uh, it's good. But as you said before, there's there's thousands of new bands every year, uh, thousands of releases every month. And it's very, very hard to break through and and be noticed. And I think you need a combination. You need a, a good product. You need um, exposure, and you need a bit of luck. Uh, uh, the, the the luck is the most difficult part. Um, for some people, they can write an album and it can be really mediocre, but you know it can be really popular. Uh, and I also find with with the established bands, uh, you know, I find a lot of bands that have been going since the 90s, they're just resting on their laurels. I think they just release a lot of shit. People buy it, people go to their concerts, and, and they're, they're, they're a career band. But um, it's not for me anymore. Adam, uh, thank you very much for taking the time today. I will put obviously here the link to your Bandcamp for people who can find your uh, music. Do you still have uh, physical uh, copies available or is it only digital for now? Uh, we have CDs available. Um, you can buy from the Bandcamp site or you can buy from uh, Grind to Death Records. Uh, you, sh you should probably buy from them because uh, we, we've sold quite well um, on our Bandcamp. So I would I would hope that the record label's also selling some CDs. Uh, so if not, definitely buy from them. Um, we have the vinyl coming out, which is supposed to be in a week, but I'm, I don't think that's going to happen because I haven't even received a test press. Uh, oh, okay, fantastic. So, yeah, and that's coming out on Corrupted Flesh in Germany. Adam, thank you so much for the time. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Oh, take care of yourself, man. Bye-bye. Yeah, yes, bye-bye.